All right, recording? All right, we're, we're in business. And let's do this. Hey everybody, it's the Engineering Podcast. I'm Adam. I'm Brian. And I'm Leah Culver. I am the CTO of Breaker, an app for listening to podcasts and discovering new podcast episodes that you'll love. Sweet. That was great because then I didn't even have to, I didn't have to like awkwardly try to transition into an intro. That was the best uh, guest self intro we've had so far, I think. No, it was. Sure. <laughs> Thanks. I've been practicing. You nailed it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thanks thanks to uh, Leah for coming to hang out for an hour. Thank you guys for having me. Chatter about this stuff. And thanks, as always, to our backers on Patreon who throw us as little as a buck an episode to help uh, keep this thing going. We're, uh, we're currently working on a way to get the Patreon backers into our Slack uh, channel so they can watch all this stupid pre-production chit-chat that happens. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, we're I hoping to get I, everybody in there soon. I think Sorry that we weren't ready for you, Leah. <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to have live chatter uh, with everybody and all of our listeners. Uh, see what's going on. Contribute to what we're producing beforehand, after recording. Uh, it's been really helpful with the friends that we've had in there. So, look forward to that, please. But uh, I feel like let's. Do you want to start? Just like tell us a little bit about sort of breaker. Uh, like you said, it's a it's a podcast consumption app, um, primarily. Yeah. So Breaker right now is only available on iOS. So I should put that out there up front. Um, sorry, Android users. <laughs> iOS app for uh, listening to podcasts, so very listener focused. So if you're listening to this podcast right now, maybe you're listening on Breaker, but you definitely could be listening on Breaker. <laughs> um, and what's different about it is there's this social component. So when you sign up, you have the option to follow friends that you know from Twitter and Facebook. Um, and you can see sort of what they listen to. You can also like episodes. Um, and those that activity also shows up to uh, the people who follow you. So it's, it's a different sort of way to find podcasts. Um, I really like seeing what my friends are listening to. I'm a bit of a snoop. <laughs> so, <laughs> of our team, I'm probably the biggest snoop. That's uh, what the, the internet work on for. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, some people like just getting the recommendations. So we also do recommendations on an episode level. So we have kind of like what episodes are hot right now, and we mm -hmm. can talk more about how we're handling discovery. But we really want to surface not just like podcasts, but like individual episodes that are mm -hmm. really good because a lot of podcasts will do more episodic content, like an interview or a particular story. So each episode is quite different. Um, and we want to show listeners sort of, you know, what's hot right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely, that. we range from stupid conversations about <laughs> me losing my cart in Costco <laughs> <laughs> to really technical breakdowns of how quantum computers work. So from episode to episode, we're... We swing demographics pretty wildly, I would guess. Um, yeah, Leah, you just touched on a spot that I think is really interesting because it kind of transcends just podcasting. And it's what do we do in a world where so many people are producing so much interesting and good content? Um, and I think we can kind of build up to that as we get through the episode that feels like a right like a yeah. the, the topper yeah because <laughs> I, I still want to like immediately launch into filter bubbles totally. and um presidential candidacies <laughs> 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 um no and i feel like the place to to start really is to back it up just to uh, podcasting in general um brian and i were talking a bit before you hopped on Leah, and and like it strikes me that the thing with podcasting that's interesting is it's not like video content youtube videos are very different from television and television is very different from movies and then we talk about podcasts like oh it's a big shift in the media landscape or it's a shift in the medium media landscape but it's not really like delivery at least as it stands now and i think this is something that breaker is attacking it's still essentially just talk radio um or, I mean, a proof of that is that some of the most popular podcasts 
are just NPR shows that they sort of repackage with slightly different advertising and they put out as podcasts and they're still popular. We definitely see that changing. So I think historically it's been a lot of, you know, a person in their bedroom making a recording or um, popular radio shows just being translated um, online. And, and now we're starting to see new forms of content sort of emerge, so more storytelling. Um, so things like serial storytelling through, of course, the show Serial, um, but also S-Town. Um, I just started listening to one called Rabbits, mm. uh, which is pretty good. So there's so more like long-form storytelling. Um, there's some kids' shows now, which is different. Um, so, so yeah, so there's a lot more variety in content. And what we're concerned about at Breaker is not necessarily – you know, focused on one type of content, but really how can we match listeners with things that they'd be interested in? Well, I think that's the coolest, like it's, it's sort of this long tail, like they say, oh, it's a shift in media. It's not really shift in media, but it's a shift in publishing. It's a shift in the ability to put the stuff out there. Cause it used to be, you had to have literally a license from the FCC to broadcast radio signal. And then people could pick that up with their radios and, yeah, there was, I couldn't just have a radio show. I mean, I could maybe on like a public level if I went to some, you know, public access PBS situation, but then, you know, it's like a between two ferns <laughs> kind of operation. <laughs> like, so, <laughs> but so when you democratize the ability to make the stuff, which when you're talking about a voice is way easier than even video, then you start to see people explore different stuff with the, with the medium but yeah. then you have this problem of so much stuff is created. How do you find the thing? Yeah. Currently, it's friends of mine say, hey, you should check this out. And then and then even then, they'll struggle to get me a link so that <laughs> I can actually listen to it. And then eventually I go, eh, uh, uh, and I just listen to something that's already in my feed. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So we have some experimental features on that side for Breaker. Like if your friends are on Breaker, you can send them an episode within the app itself. And it shows up like in their feed, which could be kind of annoying if you don't actually want to listen to the thing that your friend sent you. But most of the time, it's pretty good. So my my co-founder, Eric, just sent me an episode of the uh, show. So I, I watch The Bachelor on TV and Bachelorette now. Um, and he found a podcast where they discuss <laughs> The Bachelorette and sent it to me. <laughs> yeah, They're I used to listen good, to a Lost funny. podcast the day after every episode yeah. uh, when that show was blowing up. So. And then there's one that I keep getting in my, somebody sent me that's Lance Armstrong has been doing coverage, like daily coverage of the Tour de France. No, I did not even France. know that. Yeah. It's called Stages. Oh, so check it out. I'm very curious what you talk about for that all day. I know that's a lack of my knowledge of biking, but I can't imagine there's a lot to discuss. <laughs> it's... Well, it's, it's, it's actually a really funny one to bring up because we, when we first got on today, we were supposed to get on at nine to run through some, some, you know, just business before, uh, Leah, you got on and Brian texted me and went, I just got back from spin class and I can't get off the That's floor. That's a good point. I did just ride a bike this morning. <laughs> I need so. a half hour. Not a total lack of knowledge, but. <laughs> is it um, Soul Cycle or is it um, big? Um, I keep forgetting which one it is. Like it's not Soul Cycle. Similar. I used to go to Soul Cycle. Same thing though, like rock, pop, pop yeah. music, cycle bar. Uh, you've got like your DJ, fitness instructor up front. Um, this spot is cool because they put everyone's data up on the screens periodically throughout class, and then you have races, which oh, is God. which is like <laughs> death. So. <laughs> yeah you have to stand measured against your peers uh -huh. i'm uh i'm i would say i'm in reasonably good shape but i'm also happen to be very tall i'm six foot eight so i know if i really go for it i can i can win sometimes and so but i also die because exactly. i've only been a couple times so I, I got home and like my face was bright red i felt like i was gonna pass out i had to lay down on the floor light was like flickering a little bit but so maybe that's what they talk about on the tour de france tour de france Podcast. I'm sure it's the same <laughs> sensations. I mean, cycling, you know, I, I've never been one of those classes, but I've, I've trained for triathlon. So I've pushed myself on a bike until I think I'm <laughs> going to fall over. It's, you know, it's, just, it's a, it's a common sensation, uh, but I think that speaks to 
the idea that that's a niche, like that we can even chase down that rabbit hole of like, oh, people that have been to spin class, like maybe they would want to listen to him talk about how much it sucks to ride up a, a giant mountain <laughs> every day for like however many days that the tour is. It It's when you digitize media like that, you start to, you can potentially profit, you know, profitably chase increasingly smaller niches where maybe all that ever listens is 200 of your friends. But if that's enough, you have the broadcast mechanism to get it to your 200 mm -hmm. friends and you can, you know, it can, it can have a life. Well, that's a component uh, of podcasting that I think, uh, is really interesting. Like the technological barriers to do it, uh, have basically disappeared. Like in theory, everyone has a phone in their pocket and you could record a podcast on it, right? The audio is not going to be great. Um, editing might not be super convenient, but, uh, it's kind of the same as blogging almost now. Like anyone could get up and do this pretty quickly. We even, we want to do a post that's like post your first, first podcast in 30 minutes. But, um, that allows people like you just said, Kerp, I think to start to produce media about stuff they really care about that most people don't to serve that market of a hundred people who are interested in some super niche podcast. Um, and if you can pull away from the dollar bill being the almighty, uh, driver of everything, um, podcasting just opens up such an interesting new way for people to engage with each other and share that information. I think it's funny that you, you talked about the technology and you said, Oh, well, you know, the technology is fairly simple. It is relative to somebody can plop a, an audio file in a place and then it gets into feeds where people can listen to it. But I guess I meant accessibility. From Leah's standpoint, <laughs> I bet it's a mess. <laughs> the technology <laughs> is probably not as yeah. easy as we're thinking, right? So. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about how we handle sort of feeds and processing. So we are mostly an iOS app. So what you see is like a listener is iOS, but we do have a back end component that um, handles things. So right now, all podcasts are published as RSS feeds, right? So that's how you guys publish your podcast. Mm -hmm. um, and then podcatcher apps need a way, like Breaker, need a way to find those feeds, um, digest the metadata, like what's the title of the episode, you know, what's the description, um, the episode artwork, things like that, uh, package that to users, and then allow them to play the audio file associated with that feed. Um, so we actually maintain our own directory of podcasts, hmm. which is kind of exciting. Not all podcast apps do. A lot of podcast apps will just like hit the feeds every once in a while. But we actually have a server-side component that maintains a directory. Um, and that allows us to do things like, so for example, a lot of podcasts will have duplicate feeds. So they'll have a feed URL here and a feed URL there, and they don't always match up. And we want to make sure that we show... so. Um, we show podcasters how many subscribers they have. I think that's a little different than other apps. So we want to show you, so if you have four people subscribe to this feed URL and five subscribe to this one, we want to make sure that you see that you have nine subscribers. So that's one of the interesting challenges that we deal with is how to deduplicate information across the web. Um, I don't know if that's super interesting, um, but the other thing we've been working on lately is now how do we take podcasting forward in terms of technology? So we've been working um, with JSON feed, um, so right now everything's XML. Um, we're looking at how can publishers publish feeds in JSON and how can we consume that um, just to make it cleaner and easier to read. Um, so that's been pretty interesting. And part of uh, Apple's latest announcements at WWDC is new tags for podcasts. So Apple right now controls a lot of um, the publishing standards around what's contained in the feeds because they are the largest directory of podcasts. Um, we actually Power look at the default, right? Yeah. Yeah, but everyone publishes their feeds directly to Apple. So Apple says, we are a directory, list your podcast here. Um, Breaker, we don't do that. We actually just go out and scrape. We're like more of a Google. We like go and actually scrape for podcasts. Um, and also allow users, users can enter them as well. But um, it's mostly, it's more generated than Apple. <laughs> but so Apple gets to dictate the terms a little bit. And just recently, they've come out with some new terms to better describe how podcasts work today. So, for example, they have a tag um, to tell if your content for your podcast is episodic or if it's serial. Like if, it's, if it is one of these long term, um, long form stories, you can say so in your feeds. So they're they're doing some innovative stuff there. Um, we're going to try and respect that the best we can, but we also maintain our own directory of content. So one of the things that you guys have probably seen that we do differently is uh, also have like 
uh, uh, credit. So you guys are the hosts of mm-hmm. your show on Breaker. <laughs> that's unique to Breaker. That, that's not an Apple. That's not any data that they have. That's our own custom. So we're adding, we hope to add more custom data like that. In the future. I really yeah. liked that one in particular. Well, for our listeners, another little plug for uh, Breaker. I think Kerp and I both, I think you were already using it, right, Adam? That's actually how I think we tracked you down, Leah. But uh, I swapped over to it a couple weeks ago. Yeah, I think ago. I sent some feedback. And, uh, <laughs> and so... I try to be helpful when I'm using it. <laughs> totally. No, I, I know how hard it is to get feedback from people. So um, certainly if you're going to take time away from the pool this weekend to hang out with us, we can give you some good feedback. But uh, I noticed that feature in particular, and I thought that was really interesting. And now that you've said you're keeping your own uh, podcast directory on your back end, I also kind of figured you were doing that because you have more... Uh, like tracking data than all the other apps I'm using. And it gives me, uh, not only is that probably good buy-in for your app, it keeps people tied to it, but it lets me see stuff that I can't get otherwise. And I think long-term it's going to add this really interesting ecosystem um, where specifically like us being marked as hosts of podcasts and then you as a user will be marked as a guest on our podcast. And so all of a sudden you have sort of an organic growth of all of the the huge web of podcasts. Because I know... Uh, by nature, a lot of podcasts, at least traditionally, like the a lot of the ones I listen to, at least, uh, have a lot of guest swapping. Um, and I think that's a really <laughs> cool aspect of podcasting. There's so much intermingling of uh, friend groups, and there's this sort of attitude of people hanging out in a lot of a lot of podcasts. Ours, we certainly try to have kind of that attitude and uh, promoting that. I feel like what you're doing with Breaker is pushing podcasting in a very natural way that it wants to go on its own. Yeah, yeah. So the credits are interesting because not only as you're listed as a host, but you also get like the likes and the listens. Um, you can sort of see that data, and we actually send you like a push notification when you get a like on an episode. So whenever I'm a guest on an episode, I I get likes. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is so exciting. <laughs> It's so funny because it's so unique to Breaker, and it's we're just really in the beginning stages of that. Um, we kind of did a first version of it, and we hope to expand it to make it more robust. Like we actually add people by hand now, mm-hmm. so all the hosts and guests are added. Like I go in and add them every once in a while. Um, hopefully, we can automate that further in the future. But that's actually a philosophy of Y Combinator: is to do things that don't totally. scale. So to get businesses off the ground, sometimes you have to just do hacky things. So that's one of the hacky that's a, things. That's that a Paul Graham do. essay, isn't it? Do things that don't scale. Yeah. Don't yeah, because I mean, <laughs> so one of the things is we didn't know the effects of adding that feature, right? So let's just add it, add people by hand. Um, and now we've been gradually making it more and more automated. Um so, and it should get better too. Like we want to provide more stats for podcasters. So we should be sending you like in a weekly email at some point that says, here's the stats on your podcast. Here's what happened this week. You know, that sort of stuff. So stay tuned mm-hmm. for that. <laughs> so I feel like, I feel like there's a place to back up here and just kind of uh, do it a couple minutes talking about just RSS you mentioned earlier, like the current feed that exists, technologically speaking is sort of a really antiquated way of doing this. RSS, it stands for, like, what, what really simple syntax or something. <laughs> um, it's just a, it's a standard for delivering just all of the information that's in a website in a way where, like, all the style stuff is stripped out. It's, it's a really early web standard for passing some information back and forth, mostly, like, bloggers. It was originally... And so people built- would... Originally built to syndicate written work, right? Like a blog blog post. Mm-hmm. No, it's not syntax. It's really simple syndication. Yeah. Yeah. I always screwed it up. <laughs> I don't even know what RSS stands for. And I've well, been blogging for years. That's a great example <laughs> of how, how, you know, antiquated a standard. You're like, I don't know. It just is a thing and we use it. And and so all it ends up being is a feed that for us comes off of SoundCloud because that's what we, where we host all our stuff. It just has a picture that goes with each episode, a small set of tags where we try to describe what the episode's about, the title, and then an MP3 file. Yeah. Um, and I thought it was, uh, you mentioned Podcatcher apps, which is a, I hadn't heard that term in a long time, because that's what they used <laughs> to call them. And then Apple was just like, no, it's just the podcast <laughs> app. Um, so then those apps are just grabbing this this 
feed that we're broadcasting out into the world and trying to do, you know, whatever they can with it. But because it's kind of a, it's a, it's a limited standard in so far as really all you can pass is all the things that I just mentioned, right? Like there's no real good place in an RSS feed without clogging everything up for you to put in that like sort of social graph information you were talking about, like the association of me to Brian and then our association to the podcast itself and then all the likes and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's all break or cost them. And like, we might, we might figure out a way that we can put that back out into the RSS feed because it would be nice if you guys could say, hey, here's who our guests are. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that would be great. Yeah, <laughs> Make my job easier. I was just going to say part of the, uh, part of the RSS standard uh, or communication protocol, I guess you could almost call it, is that there's no feedback coming from it, right? You just kind of send your information out to the web. Here's a link. Anyone can pick it up and pull our information. But um, Breaker then comes in as sort of a, hey, we've got your information here. Let us give you other stuff about it now. Um, So not only could you kind of alter the standard and expand the standard maybe as an app, but you also are now centralizing stuff and capturing information. How many plays are you getting? What are you liking? Who are, who are your guests? Um, which is, uh, a different, it becomes a different type of data exchange then, which I think kicks back to a, like a cool, you know, you're talking about when you see that someone was a guest or that you can, if you can follow people, podcast, to podcast, not only is it organic, organic, you know, mechanism for finding other podcasts, but I can think of specific examples where there are certain guests who I know have their own podcasts, frequent guests on like, uh, for example, I can think of one person who I don't want to mention in case what I'm about to say is insulting (laughs) (laughs) when they do their own podcast, it's kind of dry and boring, but whenever Uh, they do uh, Joe Rogan's podcast, it's (laughs) awesome. Because his questions are different from the scientific information that they're delivering otherwise via their podcast, which also has hundreds of thousands of listeners. It's successful in its own right. But what I really like is the three hours of that particular host asking a different type of question. And so you start to get this thing where every time that person pops up on this podcast, it increases the chance that I'm going to listen to both of those people talk versus the probability that I would do so independently on any given Saturday when I'm going for a bike ride. Yeah, Leah, I'm curious if you could talk some about any interesting listening patterns that either you, you, everyone at Breaker has sort of talked about or that maybe you're seeing. Um, because I know I have a very uh, different listening style on podcasts than I think a lot of people do. I use them as kind of a, uh, I'm interested in a topic, so I'll go find a bunch of different sources on a topic and listen to like five different podcasts and five different hosts and five different guests. Um I know a lot of people just use them as sort of a uh, streaming. Hey, what's next on my stream? I want to listen to this next. And then other people have, hey, I'm a diehard fan of this. Um, what kind of interesting stuff are you guys seeing in the data? Yeah. Uh, so people do still subscribe to shows. Um, the average number is like somewhere between like four and 10 shows per person, which is probably smaller than you guys. So people who listen a lot tend to listen to a lot, like I think. Eric and I are now subscribed to hundreds <laughs> of podcasts, <laughs> but you know, that's cause it's part of our job. And, um, but for the average person, it's a small subset of podcasts that they're subscribed to. And then what we're seeing is when friends listen to episodes, um, they tend to catch on a little bit within that friend group. So, uh, if one person listens to an episode and likes it, it's a pretty high signal. Um, and so what we see is like glomming on of these likes. So like one person will like it and then they'll get like a few people that follow them will like it. And, and that's, I, I think we'll see more of that, um, in the future, but that's kind of like, that was an early signal for us with breaker back when we only had a couple hundred Mm -hmm. beta testers, it was an early signal that we were on to something interesting. Right. So we were seeing these episodes sort of bubble up, um, that I think you wouldn't have normally been exposed to, um, that because friends were listening and liking um, that you were then more exposed to and were able to to follow along. So I've actually discovered most of my podcasts through just seeing other people listen to stuff. What other, so this, this brings up a great question that maybe will help us grow our podcast. What other ways do people, do you see podcasts getting shared? Because as we look at sort of traditional ways to promote uh, media online, to promote 
uh, written media to promote visual media, uh, like pictures and infographics and stuff that all flows really well, like on Facebook and Twitter, it's mm-hmm. easy to see an infographic, digest it quickly at work, passed along. Podcasts are a huge investment for a listener. Um, even listening to like the first 10 minutes of a podcast doesn't necessarily get you in enough that you're like, Hey, I like this. I'm going to share it with a friend. So, uh, there's very little passing consumption of, of yeah. podcasts. Like it, maybe I can do the laundry while I'm listening, <laughs> but it's still an hour. It takes, you know, it's going to be this chunk of usually 15 minutes to an hour of, of which content. is cool. But then I think it's also worth mentioning that a breaker does a really good job with making it easy to share out yeah. of the breaker system also. Yeah, so Facebook, I tend Twitter. To, use it to get to Facebook, to get to Twitter, to get to text messages, in part because the share link that you guys have kicks to a place where they can just hit play and then immediately. And that's going to get a lot here. better to you guys. <laughs> I'm so excited in the future. We're starting to work on stuff where, you know, those links not only let you play right away from the web, but you could subscribe, you could add it to your playlist on Breaker. Like, we we need to close that yeah. loop we're working on. Awesome. It, so. That would be a huge help for us. <laughs> Better ways to, like, you hear about something. It's not like you have to, like, oh, remember later to go download it or, you know, have to listen immediately on your computer. But sort of we really want to become that sort of, like, listen later, save it for later kind of app as well. But going back to your question, Brian, about podcasters and what podcasters can do, um, I think the big thing is really clear titles and descriptions um, of episodes. So you no longer need to put, like, the episode number in the title. So keep that clean and clear. Um, In the description, I was having, you know, the names of guests right away. Um, really what the podcast is about, like being very clear about that. We actually feature episode art as opposed to just mm-hmm. show art, so which is pretty funny because some epi- some shows use it very wisely and some mm-hmm. don't. So most shows just kind of use the same episode art as their show art, but some get really creative. So How I Built This is an NPR mm-hmm. podcast, and they actually have custom drawings of the entrepreneurs as their episode oh, wow. artwork. That's uh, awesome. It's really beautiful. Yeah, they do a, they do a great job. Um, and then other ones like Planet Money do a weird job. Like they just have weird Perfect. random photos for their episodes. Yeah, we just so. just transitioned our workflow to be able to have compelling art, like episode <laughs> by episode. That was like literally it's hard, it's it a is. lot of work. It was a debate we had because we like we both like doing graphic design work, but uh, we were like, well, it's an awful lot of work to create a new graphic for every every episode. <laughs> it consumes time that isn't the podcast. I don't um, think it's necessary uh, to have a different artwork for each one, but it, descriptions are really important and really important to listeners. Well, our problem is it's a fun project <laughs> and we're like, we want to do it, but then we, like, we frequently have to reprioritize things around like, okay, I, I love doing these graphics. They're fun, but I don't have time to edit the podcast. <laughs> and so it doesn't matter if we don't. Um, actually, one of the things I, uh, YC's, podcast does a picture usually of the person who's speaking the guest Mm -hmm. um that was the first thing that made me go oh this is a thing that you can do and uh, particularly if we're if we're going to use guests for growth you know purposes like this person has a following on instagram so let's talk to them oh this is a good question normally this would be after the podcast having a picture of that person is a is a is a way that people will go i recognize that person i'm gonna yeah, for guest-based episodes, it makes a lot of sense to highlight who the guest is because you'll get a lot of people coming to listen to your podcast just for that guest and then hopefully stick around for future episodes. It's a great way to draw people in. So do you have a headshot in mind that you'd like us to use as our... <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you guys my headshot. I don't know if I'm going to draw a big audience. <laughs> um, oh, I had another thing I was going to ask. Oh, yeah. Uh, so just about what what I just did is a great example of something that will get cut out of this. <laughs> um, <laughs> the part where I forgot my question. Um, I talk a bit about uh, YC. Uh, sure, that's certainly sure. an experience that I haven't had. And then I guess as an introduction, Y Combinator is a is a incubator, accelerator. Yes. What's what's the right word? for? What I don't they know what themselves? they call them nowadays. The general term, they basically help startups get off the ground. Um, by doing giving them a little bit of funding in exchange for a little bit of equity, um, but going much further than that uh, in terms of they have classes. So for three months, 
you basically work on your company exclusively um, and check in once a week. Um, they have a weekly dinner and then they have various other activities. They help with setting, incorporating your business and setting things up legally. They help out with that. YC doesn't really do things for you. They help with most things, um, but it's an interesting experience. So uh, I had done Y Combinator for the first time in 2011 with a different company uh, that was a chat product um, that ended up not succeed- being successful. <laughs> but luckily, <laughs> I got the chance to interview again with Breaker for Y Combinator, which at the time was a side project between me and my co-founder, Eric. Um, so we interviewed to do the Y Combinator program. Um, we had, hadn't even incorporated the company yet. We were just running it as a side project with beta testers. We had a couple hundred beta testers. Um, and we were accepted. And so we started in January and we incorporated in December so that we could get our funding. <laughs> so <laughs> we run companies a little bit backwards at Breaker. It's so funny because my co-founder, Eric, just yesterday made a fake business card because he needed to send a business card to someone. So he like printed it out on his home printer and took a photograph of it and was like, will this work? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't even like on cardstock or anything. Right. Like that. So we kind of do things a little bit backwards at Breaker. Uh, we kind of do software first, um, users first, really focusing on building the best product. Our goal has always been to um, have a really engaging app. So we want you to use Breaker and come back if not daily, every week. Um, So that's been our goal for most of the time we've been working on it and everything else has been rather secondary. So Y Combinator was definitely an interesting experience. We were able to get a bunch more beta testers, so we were really able to test things. And then through Y Combinator, we learned different techniques for gathering user feedback as well. So we can, I'm happy to talk about that a little bit because if you're doing your own startup, it's pretty interesting. We started by just our testing with our friends and they would just tell us what they thought of it. (laughs) Right. But of course, that that doesn't <laughs> scale. So <laughs> we had to do. And that's some not a stuff. thing that doesn't scale. That you should keep doing. Also, <laughs> yeah, mom. What mom? What do you think of this? Oh, honey, it's great. Yeah, it's still we, great. we do. <laughs> oh my gosh, we still do. We still go in person and watch people use the app. We definitely do that. But of course, we can't do that for every single user. Right. And we want to get more data in aggregate of what our users are doing. So. Um, the first thing we added was a way in the app to send us feedback. So we use something called bug life. Um, but you could probably use any bug reporting tool so you can take a screenshot in the app and it asks you, Hey, did you see a bug? Would you want to report it? Um, you can also just go to the settings screen and report a bug from there or send feedback from there. Um, we have an error logging and error tracker sentry that we use to catch exceptions, which isn't terribly interesting, but sometimes combined with a bug report, it's, it makes it easier to track down issues. Um, And then more on the feature side of things, we use Mixpanel, uh, which is metrics tracking to find out what people are doing in the app. Um, And this is interesting uh, because it helps us figure out um, sort of what's working and what isn't and what people, what actions people are taking and what things they're not doing. Um, And it's been super helpful for things like our onboarding flow. So when you first sign up to Breaker, we optimized our onboarding flow to go from, I think, like a 30 something percent drop off to less than 20. So it it dropped down quite a bit uh, for us. So that was good to get people through the onboarding flow better. So we cut out some steps, we made some steps easier. It also helped us uh, do things like increase engagement in the app. So every feature we were thinking about, you know, will this help people keep coming back to the app? So things with like following friends and things like that, we did a lot of tracking and measuring on how we could get more people to stick around and, and get into the app. So, so Focusing on retention was nice. We were able to actually have a measurement for that and, and make those numbers better. So it was nice to have like a number that you're working towards, whether it's during your cycling <laughs> class or <laughs> right. uh-huh. in app development. I mean, it's, in, it's, it's very controversial being metrics driven or not these days, um, but we like to do like a combination of metrics driven along with sort of more intuitive development but it, I mean, it's, it's been all, it's it's all just their data points right it's kind of yeah. it's it's like anything in science where you're just sort of like okay well that means something <laughs> and the argument is about what it means but it doesn't mean you should collect <laughs> it and pay attention to it yeah and um, and we have definitely been able to move those numbers like the onboarding one is a good example of a place where we saw an actual issue and were able to fix it um and that sort of stuff is just 
super valuable. We wouldn't have had that insight if we hadn't had um, metrics. It's also, it's worth mentioning about Y Combinator that they are like, it's, it's partially existing in the space that they're in is a numbers game. You have a certain number of companies in a class out of that. You want a percentage of those to be successful and then you can keep doing what you do, you're doing by those companies being successful in your percentage, making you money. And, and, you know, there's a model there. Mm -hmm. YC yeah. really good at it. Uh, they, yeah, they, well, they, they also collect a lot of data, right? So right. they're very data driven. <laughs> um, <laughs> they say, Hey, we're going to fund these hundred, 150 companies for these next three months. And we're going to track how they do. And they actually ask us to feed in data. They ask right. how, yeah. you know, they, we log every investment that we take and we log how much money we have every week. Wow. So they know our burn rate. Right. They know who all of our investors are. Um, not so much on the product and feature side. They're <laughs> definitely more on the financial <laughs> tracking side. <laughs> but they also keep office hours throughout the lifetime of your wow. company. So you can go meet with, like I could go meet with someone from Y Combinator next week if I wanted to, right? And, and Question. most good companies it. do meet with their advisors fairly regularly. Right. So when you talk about those meetings, I feel like they're probably, you know, it's it's like broad questions where you can just go in and go, I, here's the problem. Uh, <laughs> not really sure what to do. No, actually, so they, <laughs> they have, have a really lot smart of different... people with, you know, <laughs> skill sets to a help answer you. You know, well, they have I never lots had of that, partners. Right? I just yeah. guessing with every startup I ever ran like, oh, this feels like the right thing <laughs> to do. Uh. <laughs> no, but they have a wide network of partners and different partners specialize in different things. Partners, advisors, friends of YC that you can sign up to have office hours with, and they all specialize in different things. Some are more general startup advice. Um, we met with someone who was specifically around metrics and numbers, um, helped us get our, our stuff running. Um, we've met with someone specifically in branding and marketing. Um, we met with legal <laughs> legal team on some yeah, some dollars. issues, but we actually we have our own lawyers too. YC doesn't do all of your legal things for you, but they they basically can help sort of guide you in the right direction um, when you have questions. We so for more SaaS or operations companies, they have experts in those as well. Um, we of course are a consumer app, so we've mostly been meeting with the folks on the consumer side of things. So to kick back to the other thing we were talking about with metrics and everything, the the thing, like when you talk about that onboarding process and you say, you know, 30% to 10% and, you know, these numbers that I feel like to the average person doesn't mean much. The thing that yeah. I'm super familiar with because of digital media and I always have to explain to people and it always comes out in the same way. People on the internet are so fickle and spastic <laughs> and their attention spans are so low like really yeah. the metrics on youtube videos like if you don't grab them in the first 20 seconds you've lost them and they never come back and check you out again so when you're talking about chasing metrics for friction it's like i could send a link to a family member and they can say oh i want to listen to this thing so they click on the link and then a certain percentage is going to go oh i have to oh this is a separate app <laughs> fuck it i'm out <laughs> And then a certain percentage is going to say, I got to remember a login. Okay, I'm done. And then they go and they do Ooh, whatever else they were doing. The you know, so. me. <laughs> yeah, the login actually gets a lot of people. So we require you log in for Breaker. And that was a real, right. really hard decision early on. Is like a lot of podcast apps, you don't need to log in or anything. Um, we really want to do it for the social aspect, um, for the following and the liking and things like that. So... We felt it was really important. So our thing to make it easier was just to have those big login with Twitter, login with Facebook buttons. And now if you tap them, we just updated our Twitter library. But uh, Facebook will take you to the Facebook app. And now with the new Twitter library, it'll just take you to the Twitter app. And if you're already logged in on the app on your phone, it's just like so mm -hmm. fast. Right. It just is like there and back and you're done. And it's so much better. Which is part of what's become the Facebook sort of Twitter value proposition is consolidating a lot of these things so that this friction like to decrease that friction. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I think it's great. The faster people can get tr doing the things that they want to be doing in an app is key. And and I just, I guess the point I always want to sort of fall back to is like people go, uh, yeah, but, you know, I feel like the impulse is to say, oh, but what does it matter? If people want to use it, they'll sign in. And that's not 
how internet traffic works. <laughs> <laughs> so like the reality of like, oh, we'll use a banner ad and you got to go, no, a banner ad is a terrible idea from the standpoint of people actually clicking on it and doing the thing that they want to do. But it's not, it's like this, it's this part, it's this part of the internet that you're not really aware of unless you've got a foot in there. And then once you have a foot in, it's like, oh man, people have no idea how this stuff works. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's hard to get people to do anything. In life. Thirty to ten percent is awesome, yeah. right? It's but it conversion. but it feels like one of those things where this. How do you contextualize it, right? And it's so. So Leah, you. Yeah, yeah, it's, that seems like a big change to me. I'm like, wow, <laughs> we're doing so much better, you know. Unless you're working in metric land all the time for software, it's, you know, it seems fiddly. But you know, whereas the difference to your average now. person between yeah. thirty cents and ten cents is meh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so. They're not, the way yeah, that we're taught you know, percentages is partially hundreds, flawed. thousands of users, you know, it's, it's, you know, the difference right. between someone using your app and not, it's a big deal. Um, so Leah, with the decision to require users to log in, to track all, all this extra mm -hmm. data, to see what their streams are doing, give them feedback, what they're listening to time into the ecosystem. I'm curious what breakers big vision is. What was the pitch to Y Combinator and where do you guys, <laughs> Where do you guys see yourselves or where do you see, you don't necessarily need to reveal your direction entirely, but where do you see podcasting in a year or two years or three years? That's, a, that's, that's not what you talk about in Y Combinator pitches. You talk about zombie survival <laughs> skills, right? <laughs> 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 so Eric actually gave our pitch. at So at the end of Y Combinator, you have a demo day where you pitch to investors. Uh, Eric did the pitch and he wrote and practiced it without ever telling me what he was going to say. <laughs> so I saw the pitch for the first time at the same time as wow. everyone else, which was crazy. That's a lot of trust. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did a great job. No, he nailed it. Uh, it was amazing. And his pitch was basically the podcast industry is growing every year. Uh, it's actually growing linearly, not exponentially, mm -hmm. which is a little disappointing. You want to see exponential growth. But I think with improvements mm -hmm. in technology, it can grow a lot faster. So podcasting is growing year over year in terms of like the n percent of people who have listened to a podcast in the past month is growing every year. Um, so that's pretty exciting. And then based on that, where we want to go with podcasting is in the next five years, maybe in the next even two years, we want to be like the YouTube of pod podcasts. We want you to be able to follow people, to find new content that you wouldn't normally be able to find. Um, and then potentially after that, become more like the Netflix of podcasts. We want to have all the best content, everything you'd want. We want to be able to recommend things you want. And we want to start um, producing like our own um, exclusive content and have subscriptions and mm -hmm. things like that. And I don't think we're there yet. Um, that's like the longer term vision, because I think right now we need to grow listenership mm -hmm. and we want to connect listeners. We don't produce content, but we see better and better content being produced. And we want to be able to connect those listeners with that great content. That's our goal. Our goal is to grow podcasting right now, not necessarily grow breaker. Mm -hmm. It's grow the whole industry of podcasting. Okay. How can we make podcasts more accessible and really help connect? It's all about connecting listeners with content that they'll love. You know, I think that's a wonderful. Point. And for what it's worth, all of those <laughs> things are why are you know why I like uh, Breaker as yeah. an app, and the and the onboard is certainly friction. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing looking at the <laughs> the apps that have existed up until now because podcasting is not new, and there are there are podcasts that are not just radio shows; they're purely podcasts like Tim Ferriss Show or the Joe Rogan Show. They've been around for six, seven, eight, ten 10 Long years. Time. I don't know. And yeah. they're huge, hundreds of millions of downloads. <laughs> so tr tremendous listenership. But the, the technology has remained uh, absolute bare bones, right? Like most of the podcasting apps are literally just pulling the RSS feed, like you said, and just redisplaying the data. They're just mm -hmm. web scrapers uh, harvesting data and selling it off somewhere, right? It's, it's like the lowest of the low with the technology. And um, with podcasting, I feel like not only is there a huge opportunity to start to develop communities around it. Um, but there's also, I think there's some other technological barriers. Uh, for me, one of them that seems like a problem with people is it just, it doesn't fit with people's day-to-day -day workflow yet. Like you get in a lot of the places that I listen to podcasts are 
uh, in the car, when I'm cleaning the house, when I'm working out, and people have uh, other means of consumption that kind of dominate that that those phases already. Especially like the car, the car like turn the radio on to get a podcast up. Actually, no, maybe it's just because I have an old car and I don't have Bluetooth yet. That would really solve <laughs> a lot this, of problems. This is, this is changing. <laughs> This is actually one of the reasons I was so excited to get into this space is that the hardware is accelerating yeah. so quickly. So car technology is supporting podcasts better than ever before. So we have smart cars with Android Auto, mm-hmm. Apple CarPlay. Um, hopefully Tesla's gets better. Oh, my gosh, those are so bad. Um, but hopefully <laughs> very soon cars will have these entertainment centers that are more accessible to developers. Um, so that's a shift we're seeing. Another one we see is in the home. So things like Alexa, uh, the Amazon Echo, Google Home, um, Sonos, uh, Apple has their new, um, what is it called? Home, HomePod. HomePod. HomePod, <laughs> yeah. So, so a lot of these companies are playing around with smart home. And with smart home, you get the audience. So cars is the commuters. Smart home is the when you're doing chores around the house, cooking mm-hmm. dinner, cleaning up. Um, and then the other place that we're very popular is when you're out and about. So commuting via subway, or I actually got into podcasts through running. Uh, totally. <laughs> so, so when you're working out, so athletes like to listen to podcasts quite frequently. And there we're seeing improvements in uh, Bluetooth technology. Mm. So headphones, uh, both, you know, sort of like AirPods are really taking off in terms of making it really easy to connect with your phone really fast to listen to things. But also just Bluetooth has gotten like so much better. (laughs) Well, I think there's an interesting behavioral psychology component that I think is what you're attacking with the social Mm -hmm. side of things, which is like my dad who listens to talk radio in the car just doesn't think to listen to a podcast at the time in his life when he's craving that type of entertainment content or whatever you want to call it stimulation i guess <laughs> like, he just doesn't i go oh i'll put a <laughs> podcast on and my you know uh, people of like past a certain age just don't yeah but that's the, where the difference is between like the people who get like netflix versus like cable tv yeah, right we're right. a generation where we just yeah. get it it's like i want to watch the show i want to watch right or i want to binge <laughs> watch a show right, right. like you can do that with podcasts. You can't do that. Well, there's a little bit of a uh, shift, a little bit of burden that's put on the user at that point. And I think if there's a technological friction, then you're out, right? Because if when you go to watch Netflix, you have to like make your own decision. You don't just go and scroll. You don't just go to channel five and watch what's on primetime TV, right? Um, yeah, but I think overall, people really prefer choice and availability. Um, it yeah, allows there just, to be so much more value. Or digital, I didn't have it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm on the fence. Maybe we need a button on Breaker that's just like, play me something <laughs> random. Because <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I get what you're what... saying. Like, sometimes I go to Netflix and I'm like, I don't know what I want to watch. Sometimes I go to bed I angry need... because I can't find the thing that I want to watch on Netflix. So I run out of steam. And I go to bed <laughs> unsatisfied. <laughs> oh, no. Do you, do you use like the recommendations they give you? Like, hey, you should watch this thing I don't well know. i actually use my friend's netflix account so the recommendations aren't necessarily <laughs> oh, no. uh. that's where you're going wrong oh my gosh i can't stand looking at other people's netflix <laughs> accounts oh my gosh well it's weird yeah it's yeah like, it's like oh, recommending all this stuff i would never watch into anime huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it's too much information on your friends i think most of the time yeah okay, don't well, share your breaker account with your friends you don't right. want to get anything any weird weird recommendations just sign up it's easy and <laughs> right, so we're we're pretty free. I think we have to... it's free <laughs> that's the key we yeah, have to uh we gotta wrap go, but up, i have a but... i think i have a good concluding question uh that's if good. you were a budding podcast with pretty good hosts and really awesome guests what would be your number one recommendation uh, to do to grow your cast and to integrate uh, in a rapidly changing ecosystem? That is a great question. Uh, make sure your data is really clean and straightforward, that you're very focused on uh, what your podcast is about and who you are as a personality, have your own personality and your own show, and then promote it. So get on Breaker, 
like episodes so that they move up in those charts, uh, promote on Twitter, Facebook, really get it out there, really talk about it with people, um, get people listening. Because once you get a few listeners in the door, uh, it spreads from there. So, Awesome. And last question then, awesome. should you like every one of your own episodes? <laughs> Oh, this is this is such a tough. Do you like every one of your own tweets? I don't oh, good that, or like your good, own good, Instagram? Good analogy. No, no, I don't know. I I mean, people do it. <laughs> I, I I'm not a podcaster. Know. I'm only a guest. But I always like the episodes where I'm a guest. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> that makes you see it. where I go with it, but <laughs> yeah, I like retweets on Twitter. So uh, but, yeah, uh, I would say yes. <laughs> but. Yeah, thanks for hanging out. Yep, thank this, you so much for having me. It's so cool to hear about stuff from, you know, you're just, you're in there and, it, you know, I think about this project constantly, but it's from a content standpoint, right? Yeah. Um, it's cool to hear about the work that's happening Absolutely. on the other side of this kind of, like you said, it's linear, but I, I wouldn't be in the space if I didn't think that was going to change. I think it's going to blow up in the next few years. So keep an eye out. I think awesome. it's going to be big. So. We, we do too. Right on. It's, it's awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks to the listeners for hanging out if you made Absolutely. it this far. And special thanks, as always, to our Patreon backers. Help keep this thing, this thing yeah, going. And... It's not, it's not, you know, it's not expensive to start <laughs> on a podcast, but it's not free either. <laughs> and if you currently have a podcasting app, or if you don't have a podcasting app, you should check out Breaker on your iPhone. Because uh, I've been using it for a couple of weeks, and it's my favorite podcast app now. Oh, thanks. For that. Cool. Well, this is, is Engineering. Thanks for hanging out. I'm Adam. I'm Brian. I'm Leah. Fabulous time in the desert. <laughs> <laughs>